Frank Fukuyama, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks very much, Yasha. It's great to be on again. Well, it's it's always a, a pleasure and a privilege to 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 speak to you. Um, and I'm especially excited about this conversation because I've just read a draft of your next book. Um, and there's been many defenses of liberalism over the last few years. Um, there haven't been any so far that I found to be really uh, satisfying that I felt made the thoughtful but also full-throated defense of it that we need. Uh, and in my opinion, your, your book is that, so I'm, I'm, I'm excited to talk about it. Um, uh, I actually found your discussion of what liberalism is to be really clarifying. So, you know, what is this tradition that uh, we like to talk about, we like to worry that it's embattled, but we often have trouble uh, uh, putting into words? Sure. So uh, it's a really old uh, doctrine, and I think there's several reasons that um, it's around. It's been around for such a long time. I mean, there's a pragmatic, political reason. Uh, I think there's a moral reason, and then there's a very powerful economic one. The practical one, I think, is one that we've kind of lost sight of, uh, which is that liberalism is really a, a doctrine meant to deal with diversity when people really don't agree on some fundamental issues, but they live in the same society, how do you get them to live peacefully with one another? And that's related to its origin. It, it came out of the wars of religion in Europe following the Protestant Reformation when Protestants and Catholics spent 150 years killing each other. And I think that the founders of liberalism basically said, look, if we're gonna base a society on some religious doctrine uh, of some particular sect, we're never going to live in peace because nobody agrees on those. And so let's, you know, let's detune uh, politics and agree that we all need to live together and push religion into a kind of private sphere so you can worship whatever you want, but you're not going to impose it on, uh, on anyone else. And I think that, you know, over the years, that's really been one of the most powerful selling points is that you have real diversity in societies. I mean, a couple hundred years later, it wasn't religion, it was nation, you know, Germans versus uh, Poles or Russians versus, you know, um, uh, other people. And uh, I think for the same reason, liberalism uh, after 1945 became the dominant doctrine because if you base a, a society on one particular ethnicity and one particular culture, you can't deal with, you know, people that aren't of that uh, ethnicity and culture. And, we live in a pretty mixed world. And so, you know, right now, when you use the word diversity, I think a lot of the left has captured that and they have a, only a very limited understanding of diversity. It's really things related to race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, but there's political diversity as well. Uh, and you need liberalism because people really don't agree about a lot of things in politics. So that's, that's a starting point at least. I feel like part of that answer speaks to um, a strange tension within liberalism. Um, it, you put in, in the book, individualism is, of course, an important element of liberalism. Um, but that has often led to a critique of liberalism from communitarian political thinkers who say, well, look, liberals have this real misconception about the world in which uh, you know, we tend to think of people as these, you know, disconnected individuals who are not embedded in communities, who are not embedded in religious traditions, who are not embedded in families with obligations. And, you know, they turn 18, they just choose what kind of life they want to have. But you know, that's not what human life is actually like. Um, and so therefore, there's something wrong with liberalism. And it feels to me like the, the way in which we're emphasizing the origins of liberalism is is starting to respond to that criticism by saying, no, look, actually liberals aren't ignorant about the importance of groups. They have thought very deeply about how you can have a society in which there are all of these different groups and you need principles to keep the peace. No, that's absolutely right. I think that if you look at a, any real world liberal society like the United States, like France, like Germany, there are actually all sorts of groups uh, you know, it's not as if everybody's living in the little private world disconnected with their families and friends and people that, you know, think uh, like they do. Um, uh, the, the problem, I think, is that the doctrine uh, that's based on individualism um, 
was picked up, I think, especially by modern economics and turned into a kind of dogma where for the economists, you know, there is no such thing as society, that everybody's just a selfish individual. And the only way you get to society is by them calculating that it's more in my interest to cooperate with another person than it is to, you know, do things on my own. Uh, and that leads to, I think, first of all, fundamental misunderstanding of, of human nature, because we are selfish individuals. Nobody would say that we don't respond to incentives and, and that sort of thing. But you know, I think the pandemic, above all, has shown how intensely social we are as, as human beings, that if we are isolated in our individualism, we feel terrible. Uh, and you know, the moment that we can actually get together with other people and reestablish connections, we you know, flock to it, uh, just the way people have been doing you know, the moment these um, uh, social distancing rules have been uh, relaxed. But you know, it seems to me in a real world liberal society and certainly in the proper understanding of liberalism, uh, you take both of those sides seriously that we are both defined by the groups that we choose to be members of. And we're also uh, individuals that don't have to accept uh, those choices. I mean, obviously the, the difficulties come in because some of the groups that we are parts of are not ones that we've chosen. And I do think that there is a little bit of a liberal tendency to try to pretend that every single group we're a member of is one that we voluntarily accepted, uh, which is, I think, the ideal. But you know, the fact is that there are these characteristics like race and gender and, and, and so forth that actually uh, you know, define uh, us as members of groups. And I think that's what a lot of the current fight about is about you know, when you talk about things like identity. So, so what is the right conception of how to deal with that tension? I mean, in one kind of uh, valence, it is the fight that liberal political philosophers have with communitarian political philosophers, or sometimes, of course, multiculturalist political philosophers, or, for instance, communitarian, uh, com communitarist, um, in which, you know, uh, liberals say the individual is the basic unit of society. And so if you grow up as a member of a group, that's all fine and well. But if you want to leave that group, then the state needs to step in and ensure that you're able to leave that group even against the will of uh, you know, your religious elder, whoever else it may be. Whereas there's an alternative tradition that criticizes liberalism that uh, tends to say that it's actually the groups that have a constitutive unit of society or of a state. And at that point, it seems to be difficult to explain why the state might have a right or even an obligation to step in to help these individuals escape. So how sort of how do liberals think through that and what do you think the nature of this fight you're describing is today? Well, I think one important distinction is between um, what sociologists call ascriptive and voluntary uh, uh, groups. So an ascriptive group is one that you're born into simply because of biology. You know, because of your 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 sex, your uh, race. Uh, I mean, I, I realize that these are to some degree uh, socially constructed categories, but as you yourself say in your forthcoming book, you know, not entirely. Uh, uh, you know, there is a there is a kind of biological basis to them, and I think that it becomes particularly problematic when that biological group that you are assigned to becomes essential and when you start to believe and the state begins to believe that that's the most important thing that they can know about you, as opposed to what you as an individual with your own experiences and upbringing and you know, moral priors and so forth uh, believe. And that's, I think, where um, that kind of, of focus on, on uh, groupishness uh, you know, really begins to go wrong because it really denies the individual agency that I think is critical to, uh, to all of us. Uh, I think that on the other hand, I've been always very sympathetic to the more communitarian critics of you know, really strict liberals like John Rawls, uh, because I do think that sociability is such a deeply ingrained uh, aspect of human nature that you, know, you, you need to give uh, you know, due uh, respect to people's desire to, you know, to be with other people in groups. Uh, 
Uh, but you know, to the extent that those can be ones that they have voluntarily chosen, I think that liberalism certainly not only doesn't have a problem with it, 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 it actually encourages that. I mean, the freedom of association you know, is one of the most uh, uh, fundamental uh, liberal rights that a liberal state uh, gives you. So I do think that there's a way to sort out you know, what kind of communitarian uh, belongings are, are healthier and more legitimate and, and, and which ones really do serve as a, uh, as a, a real constraint on, on your individual choice. So uh, you, you mentioned your, your criticism of John Rawls. Um, uh, you know, this is an internal fight within liberalism. And it seems to me that you're making the argument that uh, sort of John Rawls was actually a, a, a sort of a false path within liberalism. Um, explain a little bit more why you feel that Rawls is too individualist or individualist in the wrong way and what the alternative tradition within liberalism is that well, we should- Well, oh, sure. So I think that, you know, one of the other big uh, arguments in favor of liberalism has to do with the concept of dignity. And uh, at least in the kind of Western uh, civilization that we've grown up in, that really has a lot to do with choice and the possibility of, uh, you know, essentially moral choice. Uh, I, you know, in, in a lot of my writings, I've kind of traced the intellectual history of this. I really do think that it comes out of this Judeo Christian tradition, you know, Adam and Eve are cast out of the Garden of Eden because they make the wrong choice. But the fact that they can choose also gives them a moral status that's higher than, you know, plants and animals and, and the rest of created uh, nature. And I think over the centuries that has really um, evolved into our understanding of what gives all of us uh, dignity. So you know, Martin Luther King in his famous uh, 1964 speech says, you know, I look forward to the day when uh, Americans will be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their characters. Meaning, you know, it's that ability to make right moral choices that really gives us dignity. And that's what the, what the uh, state uh, needs to accept. Uh, so, you know, choice is very important, but Traditionally, it's been understood choice within a pre-existing moral framework. You don't get to make up you know, the, the, the framework. That's not a component of your choice. But in Western philosophy, by the time you get to the late 19th century and writers like Friedrich Nietzsche, that's exactly what he was talking about. He said the freest person is his character Zarathustra that not only can obey the law, but makes the law uh, himself. And so choice becomes detached from you know, any of the moral frameworks that previously had defined how societies uh, understood themselves and choice itself, just for its own sake, detached from any of the other goods that, that people may pursue uh, uh, is, is what is valuable. And Rawls is just the culmination of this. I mean, he takes us to the extreme. I mean, there's a formulation that, that theorists use you know, where he says justice is prior to the good and translated into normal English, what that means is that the uh, preservation of your right to choose is more important than the substance of whatever it is you choose. Uh, and I think it's a kind of absolutis absolutization of choice over the things that people in the real world want to choose. I mean, some of us actually want to live in a religious tradition. And we don't want to be able to say, you know, that we're God and, and we're deciding what's right and wrong. We want to live within uh, a moral framework that has been uh, pre-established, that you know, uh, that gives coherence and meaning because it's a, you know, very large and complex uh, uh, body of thought that that lies behind it. We don't want to be able to make stuff up, you know, on our own. So I think that Rawls, you know, absolutizes choice. Uh, and downplays, you know, the other aspects of moral behavior that uh, I think are very important to what we think of ourselves as, a, when we think of ourselves as people with dignity that, that have an ability to choose. So what's the alternative within liberalism? Because clearly, as we were saying in a moment ago, we do feel that if you're raised within a particular religious tradition and you want to leave that, you need to be able to choose to do that. And yet at the same time, I think you're right, but it's absolutely crucial that liberals recognize that the vast majority of people are not going to choose at 18 
what kind of uh, consumption of life to pursue and the way in which I might choose what to have for dinner on my food delivery app. So how do we preserve and express the need for that freedom to make individual choices for people who, who, who do that, um, but at the same time recognize that uh, for most people, these pre-existing uh, links to their families, to their religious traditions, uh, perhaps to their ethnic communities uh, are really important. Well, I think the answer to that is actually contained in the US First Amendment, which protects uh, the right to the free exercise of religion uh, and that the state cannot prevent the free exercise. And by free exercise in First Amendment law, uh, it means several things. First of all, the state cannot prescribe what religious views you need to um, uh, follow, but you yourself cannot impose those religious views on other people. You can try to persuade them and convert them and argue with them, but ultimately, if you hold any kind of power over people, you, you, you're not allowed to use that to force them uh, to believe the same things that you do. And I think that that's been the American understanding right from the beginning, in contrast to the kind of anti-clerical French or Kemalist, you know, in Turkey, uh, understandings where the target was religion itself. I think in the United States, we've always understood that one of the basic freedoms that we enjoy is the freedom to, you know, to choose our set of religious beliefs, but that's limited by our, uh, an injunction, you know, that we cannot impose that on other people. And that's how I would interpret, you know, the tradition of liberalism prior to Rawls, that actually that ability to, uh, uh, exercise uh, religious belief freely was one of the most basic, you know, freedoms that we enjoyed in a liberal society. Um, you chronicled two different ways in which liberalism has gone astray for the last few decades. Um, and that may help to explain why it is that the critics of liberalism now seem to be in the ascendance in so many countries. Uh, the first of those is economic, a sort of transformation of liberalism into a form of, of neoliberalism that really a uh, potential role of the state, perhaps of solidarity that we have towards each other as citizens of a democratic society. Um, uh, tell us more about that. Well, so this is my opportunity to piss off people both on the, on the right and on the left. Uh, but yes, I think that there are two versions of liberalism that uh, have been carried to extremes that are really not supportable. And a lot of the unhappiness with contemporary liberalism is because of that uh, carrying to extremes. So on the right, uh, it really has to do with the evolution of economic liberalism into what's been labeled neoliberalism. Uh, some people think of neoliberalism just as a synonym for capitalism, but I have a much more specific definition that Neoliberalism is the, um, you know, the version that was associated with the Chicago School of Economics with people like Milton Friedman or George Stigler that were uh, in a way market fundamentalists and you know, really became intellectually ascendant uh, in the Reagan-Thatcher years as a guide to public policy, uh, where you know, one of the things that held that group together was a pervasive hostility to the state uh, you know, in their account, markets really were such efficient allocators of goods and resources, the state almost always got in the way of that efficient uh, allocation. And therefore, you know, minimization of, of state action became, you know, the single uh, guiding principle that, that, you know, led to um, the policies that they tried to enact. And that's something that took place all across the you know, the rich world uh, from the 1980s on. It wasn't just in Britain and the United States. Now, there was something to that because I think by the 1970s, there was too much regulation. There was a lot of stagnation due to, um, you know, inefficient state-owned enterprises in Britain and, you know, France and a lot of other countries. Uh, so there was a point to that critique, but it became a religion, you know, where the state was simply opposed, you know, whether or not there was actually something useful that it was doing. And I think that simply went too far. And a lot of the populist uh, backlash that you know, you've been writing about so much over the last uh, several years is actually due to this neoliberal 
economic world that was created where if you could squeeze a, you know, the slightest couple of cents out of a supply chain by moving uh, you know, your, your production out of North America into some Asian country, you would immediately do that. And not only that, if you could squeeze your workers, you know, you could insist that they not join a union and then, you know, nibble away at their benefits and, and so forth, you were, you know, uh, justified in doing this because there was an economist that said, well, that's what makes capitalism uh, efficient is this ruthless uh, uh, focus on efficiency. And so that was one of the versions, neoliberalism in that sense was one of the versions that I think has made uh, a lot of young people really dislike capitalism per se. I mean, today they, they kind of associate capitalism with this extremely ruthless version, ruthless and competitive uh, version of it. And, you know, that um, has had a lot of, I think, dire political consequences for all of us. Uh, um, how, so I, how are you gonna... Yeah, good. sorry. No, no, go ahead. No, I mean, we can go on to the left-wing critique, but I don't know if you want to stay on. Yeah, I have one more question about this. So um, how universal a uh, phenomenon do you think that is? What you were saying about young people disliking capitalism because they uh, associated with this form of neoliberalism um, seems to be plausible in the United States and perhaps to some extent in the United Kingdom. The same claim is often made about countries in continental Europe. Um, and of course, they have suffered from uh, the Euro crisis and the years of austerity that followed from that. Um, but it doesn't, you know, neoliberalism doesn't seem to really accurately describe the state of France or Germany or Sweden or even a country like Italy today. Um, so how do you think that applies in those countries? Well, I think that's right. Uh, the reason it doesn't uh, seem like the hostility to neoliberalism isn't such a big issue in continental Europe because neoliberalism was never that big a, a, a movement. Uh, this really well, but it was... seems to me that the hostility to neoliberalism exists, but, mm -hmm. but the underlying neoliberalism is much less in some of these countries than it is in Britain or the United States. Yeah, well, I think the underlying hostility to neoliberalism meant that neoliberalism never got a, as big a start in, in much of Europe as it did in Britain and the United States and these other Anglo-Saxon offshoots like Australia and um, uh, New Zealand and so forth. I think that uh, you know, there's always uh, much more respect for the state uh, in Germany or France that have you know, very long, deep bureaucratic uh, uh, traditions. They never made a, you, you, you never really had a French politician like Ronald Reagan, whose main focus was cutting back the state sector. They did cut it back. Uh, they were forced to, you know, by the EU. And indeed, I think that it was actually the EU Commission that had absorbed, you know, probably to the greatest extent, neoliberal ideas. And a lot of their regulations were, you know, along those lines to open up markets and to reduce levels of regulation. And I think part of the hostility to the EU, you know, is uh, a result of their pushing those kinds of policies, but it simply never got off the ground in, in continental Europe the way it did in the Anglo-Saxon world. And therefore, you know, the, the uh, reaction, you know, I think has, has not been nearly as great as, you know, I mean, Britain and the United States were the two countries that elected, you know, got out of Brexit and elected Donald Trump, you know, and these were the most neoliberal uh, countries anywhere. And I don't think that's an accident. Yeah, so perhaps the state of neoliberalism is um, more profound in Britain and the United States, and that's precisely why you have more of a populist counter reaction. Um, uh, that's, 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 that's interesting. Um, so uh, if one way in which liberalism was misshapen over the last decades is economic with the rise of neoliberalism, uh, the other, you argue, is more cultural, and it's actually a sort of doubling down or taking too far of an emphasis on autonomy and individualism, which is core to the liberal tradition, but that starts undermining itself in a certain kind of way. Um, what does that mean? Well, I think that um, it, it led to what we were discussing when we were talking about John Rawls. It's kind of the 
raising up of choice itself uh, and making that you know a, a superior moral value than any of the moral frameworks, the pre-existing moral frameworks within which choice had been limited uh, previously. And so it leads to things like a kind of innate hostility to religion because any kind of religious framework becomes a, a cage. You know, it's, it's an iron constraint that is preventing the actualization of uh, one's inner self. And there is this revaluation of that inner self, you know, this idea that all of us as a kind of Rousseauian, you know, natural man or woman residing deep within uh, each one of us. And it's really society that uh, is the evil uh, prison within which this, uh, this self is contained. And, you know, that's a very familiar trope to any teenager that, that it's really society that, uh, that's the, the big problem. And this leads to two, you know, I think, seemingly contradictory outcomes. One is a kind of hyper individualism where kind of opposing uh, constraint in itself, opposing any kind of conformism becomes, you know, the primary moral value. And, you know, what's wrong with that is, you know, they're, they're innocent uh, versions of this, but it also means that collective action becomes a lot less, um, uh, you know, a lot less possible. And in a certain way, you're seeing a version of it right now in, in the United States with the hostility to, um, you know, to vaccines and, and health mandates like mask wearing, where, uh, you know, you've actually got a collective good that the state is trying to impose and this view that individuals shouldn't uh, accept, you know, the slightest diminution of their individual choice, even in cases when that is going to affect the health of you know, their family members or their friends uh, or so forth, you know, is an example, I think, of this absolutization of choice uh, over, um, you know, over any kind of collective good. But I think that a lot of the examples of this also are on the, uh, you know, on the left where, uh, you know, there's a lot of exploration of, you know, self-actualization that, that, that leads to a kind of moral incoherence uh, that's one reaction, but the, the other reaction I think is more powerful and, and uh, one that is more concerning right now, which is that, you know, the other um, response is to say, well, actually, we are not these uh, uh, suppressed individuals. We're actually members of suppressed groups. You know, we are marginalized because of our race, our ethnicity, our gender, our sexual orientation, uh, and what is the real us is that, you know, is that group membership that is based on a fixed characteristic that we were simply born with. And that is really what uh, defines us. And I think that modern identity politics then springs from this particular source where uh, it's felt that, you know, liberal individualism is a kind of fairy tale that's told by elites that has convinced everybody that they've got individual freedom but in fact, they're living in a you know racist, sexist hierarchy, uh, and you know, and then there's a further extension of this view, which is also an attack on modern natural science that says that you know these elites that are putting you into these categories have lulled you into obedience because they control you know your cognitive processes and are telling you you know what's objectively true, and that's not that's not true either. Um, and so this is, I think, what's led to the left-wing version of identity politics that uh, then leads to, you know, uh, an equally pervasive critique of liberalism itself. And that's the point at which I think liberalism uh, ended up turning on itself. So um, I, I'm trying to think through the strange tension here between individualism and groupism, for lack of a better word. Um, so the individual element of this, you can think of in the context of something like, you know, this is my truth, or, you know, go tell your truth, or, you know, I feel that, right, which is the standard way in which American college students now uh, start any utterance. Um, uh, but then the nature of those individual truths often turn out to be not you know, I, Yasha Monk, see the world in a particular kind of way because of a particular kind of experiences I have had and uh, the way that my brain happens to work. 
uh, but it often is, you know, my truth uh, ends up being the, the truth of some identity group with which I identify. And so there's sort of an odd way where, where there is a hyper individualism or, uh, you know, the, the, the relativism about certain objective truths because everybody just has their own perspective. But what ends up filling the individual perspective with content is just the ascriptive identity uh, into which that individual was born. Um, and I can't quite, you know, put my finger on, on the relationship between these two things. No, it's very, yeah, it seems very contradictory. I think that what's really happened is that, you know, the truth of the matter is that our deeply buried, unrecognized selves are not these creative, highly individualistic uh, uh, inner selves, you know, the way that, you know, uh, expressive individualism imagines or Jean-Jacques Rousseau imagined, uh, but they are these group identities. Um, uh, you know, the sort of the classic case of this is, uh, you know, a gay teenager who is told by his parents and, you know, friends, you know, that he should date girls. And he kind of realizes that his sexuality is pushing him in uh, another direction. I mean, that's one individual version of it. But, um, you know, he comes out of the closet and then realizes that his experience is actually not so individual, that there's a lot of people that are like him. Uh, the internet in that respect has been, uh, you know, a great boon for people like this. And this is actually something where it's played a very useful role that it suddenly connects you to a social category that you didn't even realize, you know, existed uh, previously. Uh, and I think that that's the experience that many people have gone through where they, you know, they're searching for that unique individualism and they realize what they see underneath the surface is just these social identities uh, that they've been uh, uh, forced into, but, you know, they've devalued and, and they want to have that revalued. So the two kind of play off of each other. Um, one of the main criticisms that people have of liberalism is that it has never lived up to its own ideals. Now, that's true of any kind of political ideology or of any set of values. Um, uh, but, 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 but the charge goes beyond that. It is that it's not a coincidence that liberalism uh, was the ideology of states that uh, colonized other countries. Uh, of states that had, you know, blatant and terrible racial injustices within their own borders, of states that uh, denied the vote to women and oppressed them in important ways, uh, but rather that that actually, you know, is inherent in liberalism, um, that it's impossible to uh, avoid those uh, injustices for liberal society because they actually flow from liberal principles. Um, how convincing do you find that critique? Well, I find it very unconvincing for a number of reasons. I mean, there's no question that uh, liberal societies have not lived up to their promise, and that begins with the United States. And I think that the, you know, the criticisms of, you know, our racial politics over the centuries has been, you know, very justified. And no one would teach American history today without, you know, going through the terrible history of slavery and Jim Crow and all of those injustices. But I think that as an empirical matter, uh, the charge that somehow this flows from the liberal principles themselves is, is completely wrong because it's actually those liberal principles that led to um, you know, the big political events that improved things and, and made things better for exactly those marginalized categories of people. I, I think the, the central case in point would be actually the civil war right, because in uh, the, up, uh, in the uh, prelude to the Civil War, the famous Lincoln-Douglas debates revolved around the question of democracy, you know, where Stephen Douglas said, well, if people in the South vote for slavery, you know, I care not whether they voted up or down, but if they vote for it, democracy is the dominant um, uh, principle that we need to respect. And Lincoln said, no, that's not right. And he pointed to the Declaration of Independence's statement that all men are created equal. Now, many people have criticized that statement saying it didn't say women, it didn't you know, 
Jefferson was a slave owner, the author of that, you know, that particular sentence and so forth. But in his argument with Stephen Douglas, you know, Abraham Lincoln could point to that uh, principle that was clearly articulated in the founding document of the United States and say, no, democratic will cannot trump uh, this fundamental equality that was, you know, the basis of our, uh, our own independence. And so, you know, that's a case actually of the liberal principle in practice being an extremely important, uh, you know, weapon in the hands of people that wanted the liberal society to actually live up to its, uh, its ideals. And, you know, nobody needs to explain how that promise really didn't get fulfilled for the next century and, and, uh, and so forth. And, you know, there's a lot of reason to be very angry and, and you know, morally upset uh, about that. But I do think that, you know, if you just look at the historical uh, record uh, and look at what the United States looked like in the 1850s compared to, you know, what it looks like uh, now in terms of race, gender, ethnicity, you know, a whole lot of things, very hard to say that we haven't made a lot of progress. The other uh, big problem I have with people that say that this is somehow inherent in liberalism is to ask, so what's the alternative? You know, what kind of society, what principle, you know, if you're gonna say, well, a society based on the principle that all men are created equal doesn't cut it, you know, what's the alternative principle? All men are not created equal or, you know, that certain people have more privileges and, you know, ought to be treated uh, differently. And I don't think that's gonna end up uh, in such a happy society either. So I think for both of those reasons, uh, I'm, I'm really not um, persuaded by those kinds of arguments. There's a lot in that that I want to pick up on. So, you know, I think about the arguments that I've had in my life with communists, right? And I would say to them, look, uh, communism has been tried in all of these different contexts. And every time it has led to, you know, extreme state oppression. And so perhaps it tells you something about your theory. Now, they, of course, respond, well, communism has never been tried under the right circumstances, and these problems don't flow from communism itself. It flows from uh, external circumstances. Um, and so if only we finally could get the real communism, it would all be wonderful, right? Now, I'm very skeptical of that, because I think, no, it, it does flow from uh, the principles of communism in important ways. And, um, uh, and it's been tried in lots of cases. Um, so I, I'm, I'm conscious that I don't want to end up sounding as a defender of liberalism, uh, like those defenders of communism for whom I don't have very much patience in the end, even though, you know, my, my grandparents who were very decent people were convinced communists. So I have empathy for how decent people might end up in that position, but you know, I don't agree with them. Um, and it seems to me that the answer you're giving is something like, uh, well, look, but uh, in the case of liberalism, uh, societies have actually been able to improve over the course of their lifetime. So unlike communist regimes that often went into worse kinds of dictatorships over the course of a lifetime, uh, the injustices that liberal society, that characters many liberal societies, as well as non-liberal societies at the time, um, were ameliorated, and they're ameliorated in good part because of reference to uh, liberal principles, because people were able to use the founding ideals of that society as a cudgel to say, well, you say men are created equal, but as Frederick Douglass might have said in his famous 4th of July speech, look at what hypocrites you are. You need to remedy this. Um, is that roughly the strategy, or how, how can we make sure that our response as liberals to those who point out the historical failings of liberalism is stronger than the response that communists give to, you know, when, when the failings of communism are pointed out to them? Well, I think there's just a historical record, uh, you know, of the way that, uh, that people live. Uh, I think that actually, you know, there is an argument made by some of the illiberal identitarians uh, or proponents of a certain kind of identity politics that basically nothing has changed, you know, that um, there's no difference between, um, you know, police uh, beatings of, of African-American men and lynchings back in the 
20s. I think that if you actually had a good historical understanding of what it was like in that period, uh, when the Ku Klux Klan could actually hold a huge, you know, very legitimate or, or well-attended rally on the, on the National Mall, uh, you know, you'd see that that uh, wasn't correct. And that then forces, I think, uh, people that want to maintain this narrative that nothing has changed to then shift the ground of argument to say that cognitively we're somehow not seeing things correctly, that liberalism has kind of duped us into, you know, this belief in a kind of, uh, you know, rational history. And uh, we got to get rid of that and, and turn to a more subjective understanding of what, you know, the actual historical uh, truth is. And I think that's also uh, uh, pretty problematic. I actually, you know, I quoted in my book, um, Herbert Marcuse, uh, in his one dimensional man. I mean, that was in a way uh, one of the reference texts for the way that, that the left, the progressive left evolved uh, in the years since uh, the 1960s. But his basic argument is, well, you may think that you're living in a liberal society in which workers have washing machines and cars and nice, you know, suburban homes, but that's, that's false consciousness. You know, that actually that's a big illusion that big corporations have created to make you love your chains, but that's actually not true. And I think you've got to go to some version of it. In fact, I was just in a discussion group, you know, a couple of weeks ago in which one of my fellow Stanford professors just repeated that Marcuse argument verbatim. He said, you know, we don't live in a liberal society. Uh, you know, the things you think are, are freedoms are really not freedoms. So I think you've got to go through these mental gymnastics really to convince yourself that there hasn't been any improvement in uh, the conditions of, of you know, minorities and women or that, uh, uh, that change is, is somehow not possible in a liberal society. Yeah, one of the things that always strikes me about those arguments is how insulting it is to you know, the actual victims of American history. Um, you know, to say that nothing has improved in the lives of African-Americans uh, you know, over the last 50 or over the last 100 years um, is to be incredibly blithe about the people who fought for civil rights and had to pay with, it, with their lives or the people who uh, were sharecroppers in, in the South with incredibly limited rights 100 years ago and so on. Um, you know, for all of the very legitimate uh, concerns and criticisms about, uh, you know, the opportunities and uh, so on available to African-Americans today, uh, you know, to, to deny that difference is actually mm -hmm. to really, in a pretty morally repellent way, uh, underplay what it was like to be Black in this country in the 1950s or in the 1900s, let alone the 1850s. Look, in the 1960s, before the civil rights movement, uh, you, if you were an African-American, there were many parts of downtown Washington, D.C. you could not walk in. You know, it was a segregated city. Uh, I mean, yeah, I think you're exactly right that that it it requires this incredible historical forgetting to, uh, you know, to make that kind of uh, projection and, and very ahistorical. Um, the other bit that I wanted to double click on is uh, the question you started to pose about well, what would be alternatives to liberalism actually be, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think through what uh, quote unquote wokeness, what, uh, you know, this identitarian political movement that is getting very strong on the left uh, would put in its place. Uh, and, and my sense is that there's a few sort of fundamental postulates there. One is uh, that, you know, the way to think about the motor of history is through terms of identity and particularly ascriptive identity, as opposed to say class. Uh, the second is that liberalism uh, and perhaps universal or neutral standards more broadly are always discriminatory, that they always sort of lead you in the wrong direction. But the third seems to me to be something like, so what do we need to do in that case? It is to structure society explicitly as an effort to remedy historical injustices uh, 
by distinguishing between our citizens on the basis of identity groups, except for the fact that we're in, uh, you know, 1850 in the United States, or effectively in the South in 1960 in the United States, the kinds of rights and responsibilities you had were better if you were uh, white. Uh, now we want to have a system where uh, we sort of explicitly help the historical victims of oppression um, by uh, designing policies in such a way uh, that their condition improves. So um, it, it is a way of rejecting the neutrality of universalism that has traditionally characterized liberal societies in the sort of attempt at uh, overcoming historical injustices through preferential treatment for historical press groups, something like that. Um, do you think that's an accurate description of, yeah, of yeah. what I, I, I think, and, and why should we reject that? Yeah, I think that that is uh, pretty much what would happen. It's, it's really just an intensification of uh, trends that you see uh, today where in every, you know, college admissions, uh, uh, club membership, uh, promotion, hiring and promotion decision, you know, made by uh, a private company. The first question that you'd ask is, you know, what's the race, gender, you know, so forth of, of the candidate. Uh, and then once you'd satisfied, you know, those uh, uh, criteria, then you could say, well, is this person qualified or, you know, what's the background and the CV look like, you know, uh, otherwise. And there are countries that do that. I mean, um, you know, if you look at the Balkans or you look at Iraq or even India, you know, in many ways, which has had extremely extensive uh, affirmative action programs or Malaysia, you know, there are uh, countries that we still more or less count as democracies that do have these very powerful uh, affirmative action programs going. And I think that the you know, the real problem, of course, you know, the theoretical one is that, yes, we are, you know, defined to some extent by these ascriptive identities, but we are also individuals, and we also have choice, and we also, you know, bring uh, things that we alone, you know, possess to the table that other people don't, uh, and so it means a, you know, a great devaluing of, of uh, those characteristics, uh, but then, you know, you, you run into these other political problems that politics then becomes simply this fight over division of the pie between these fixed groups. And you essentially end up, you know, like Lebanon right now, uh, where everything is allocated according to what religious sect you're a member of. Uh, and, uh, you know, it leads to a great deal of rigidity. And, you know, when the demographics no longer fit that particular division, your society is stuck because you know, you've committed yourself to, you know, um, uh, dividing the pie, you know, in this in this kind of rigid fixed way. And that's not a good uh, outcome either. Um, so we're in an odd predicament, I think, which is to say that, uh, you know, there are reasons why a lot of people are rebelling against liberalism. It has uh, been perverted in these two different ways that you've talked about. Uh, and yet the alternatives to it are unpalatable. Um, so you believe, and I believe, that the answer is to renew and rejuvenate uh, liberalism. Um, I have two questions about that. I'll ask them in order one at a time. The first is, well, what does a rejuvenation like that look like? What does a liberalism look like that avoids the traps of neoliberalism or the trap of uh, an exaggerated version of personal autonomy that starts to undermine the very foundations of it. Uh, and then the second question, which I'll spare you for the moment, is about the prospects of that actually succeeding. But but what what would it look like for liberalism to rejuvenate itself in that way and what principles should guide it? Uh, well, I think that the first thing is that uh, you need to not be apologetic about liberalism. You know, in a way, that's why I've written this book is to try to remind people why they should be liberals, you know, say it now and say it loud, I'm a liberal and I'm proud. Uh, obviously, in the United States, it has a very specific connotation. So you might want to say I'm a classical liberal and I'm, you know, I'm proud. There needs to be a slightly different branding uh, there. But uh, people have to understand that, you know, being a classical liberal 
you know, has these very powerful arguments standing uh, in its favor. But the other part is, is much more difficult, and it's one uh, that you, Yasha, have talked about in the past, which is that, you know, the, the pragmatic argument for liberalism, that it's a way of governing over diversity, is powerful, but it doesn't get you out of bed in the morning. You know, you don't say, oh, am I grateful that we're not in a civil war with, you know, uh, people that don't look like me today. Uh, I think that you need a kind of more positive understanding of, you know, why you want to live in a liberal society. Uh, and that uh, partly has to do with national identity, uh, where a lot of uh, progressives, uh, not classical liberals, but, you know, contemporary progressives have downplayed the nation state or even attacked the nation as a kind of reactionary, you know, vessel for exclusion, for racial intolerance, for aggression, you know, internationally. And I think it's really important to recapture that high ground and, you know, come up with a sense of national identity that people are not just not embarrassed by, but, but are actually proud of uh, and to define that. And for that, you know, you need things, you need to have borders, you need to have a narrative, you know, a kind of shared narrative about what that identity is built around. And there are some real obstacles, both on the left and the right, you know, to, to creating that. But I think that's, that's part of what it is. And then finally, I would just say that there's a lot of other things that make liberal societies attractive, you know, that they're more innovative, they're richer, they're, you know, they're more culturally rich. Uh, you think of all of the things that have come out of classically liberal societies over the centuries. And, you know, that's basically the modern world in, in, uh, in many respects. Uh, and I think that we need to kind of constantly remind ourselves that that's really what we're fighting to, um, uh, to preserve, you know. I mean, you just think of something like jazz. I mean, I guess this is a generational thing that young people don't listen to jazz anymore, the great American songbook. But, you know, you couldn't have done that in a, in a homogeneous, you know, kind of racially exclusive society. This is something that really did flow from the fact that even back in the 1930s and 40s, when you did have Jim Crow and so forth, there still was this multiracial culture that could be created in the, you know, in the semi-liberal America of that time. And also, by the way, one of the many examples for why uh, one of the attacks in liberalism today that to me is just most apparent is the idea of problematizing mutual cultural influence. Um, that, right. you know, we should put some kind of general pole of suspicion on ways in which members of one culture might uh, be inspired by art forms or cultural artifacts that have a historical origins in a different cultural community. Right. I mean, you'd have to tear down the Doge's Palace in Venice and St. Uh, the Piazza San Marco, because all of the columns are Islamic, you know, uh, influenced by Venice's extensive dealings, you know, in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, oh, you're right. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an absurd idea that cultures can't borrow from one another. Um, so I've asked you about what some of the rejuvenation might look like. Um, we were chatting before the podcast uh, about sort of the, the views of the American elite today. Um, uh, you mentioned that you'd listened to a previous episode of a podcast with Caitlin Flanagan, where she says that, you know, there's, 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 there's the sense she has, and but I think I share that a lot of American elites that perhaps think of themselves in some broad sense as philosophical liberals uh, or classical liberals, uh, uh, who certainly operated on the basis of those liberal assumptions 10 or 20 years ago, uh, seem so willing to go along with alternatives to it, whether it be the authoritarian populism of Donald Trump, when you look at a lot of the Republican Party, uh, or whether it be some of the leftist uh, uh, attacks on uh, classical liberalism that we see in the academy and other parts of the sort of higher echelons of intellectual life. Um, that you really have to ask yourselves, do they actually believe in anything? Or at least do they in any meaningful sense believe in classical liberalism? So 
um, you know, how strong a tradition, how alive a tradition do you think classical liberalism is in the United States today? And what does that tell us about the prospects for success over the coming decades? You know, I, uh, well, so first of all, I think the much bigger current threat right now is the one that's coming from the, um, you know, the Trumpian right, uh, because I actually agree with, uh, you know, Bob Kagan that we're already in a constitutional crisis created by this narrative about the uh, election. And so that's an immediate one that we need to deal with. On the question of whether, uh, you know, non-MAGA, people you know more in the mainstream actually believe in anything um i'm not quite sure how to answer that except to say that part of it is a matter of kind of herd psychology and that um because there haven't been a lot of voices that have stood up and very firmly argued let's say in favor of free speech and said that uh, you know, like the president of the University of Chicago, that, you know, this is something that we're here to protect. Then everybody kind of looks around them and they say, well, you know, nobody else is jumping on this bandwagon, so I'm not going to do that either. And I think the reason you and I are in this business, you know, <laughs> is to try to shift uh, opinion on these kinds of issues and say, yeah, it's okay to come out and say, I'm a classical liberal and I believe it in very strongly for the following uh, for the following reasons. And I do think that it's a battle that's winnable, you know, that uh, there's some assertions that are made on the progressive left that are so out of sync with reality, but also I think with any strategy for actually holding political power in this country that uh, it isn't going to be hard to imagine a, a moment in which people all of a sudden say, hey, you know, this stuff that we've been saying or just letting slip by is, is actually ridiculous. And, you know, I actually don't believe this stuff and, and we need to return to some, uh, you know, older understanding about what the country is about and, and uh, you know, what are the principles that, that guide me. Uh, so that's my hopeful gloss on, uh, on your question. So it doesn't require actually people believing in things differently deeply. Uh, and I'm not sure, you know, that in previous generations, they actually did believe so deeply, or the belief was based on other things, you know, so for example, uh, in American history, uh, belief in Christianity was very much tied up with belief in the American project. Uh, and that is something that theoretically is a little bit you know, questionable uh, whether it ought to rest on that religious basis. Uh, but that's certainly something that's never going to come back. I mean, and we're never going to go back to a moment where, you know, people say, well, this is a Christian country and that's why I love America. Um, uh, that's just never going to be, a, I think, ever again, a majority opinion in this country. In that sense, uh, you're right that, you know, we have a, have a problem, but I'm also not sure that that's something we want to go back to. So we both believe that uh, liberalism and democracy go together, that we need both of them, but also that there can easily be a tension between them, that a majority of the people can favor deeply illiberal policies and that there can be somewhat liberal states but that aren't democratic. Correct me if I'm mis misrepresenting. Yes, no, correct. Position. Um, I wonder for whether in this case, uh, democracy is, is truly our friend, which is to say that um, you know, when I look at some of the opinions of uh, the American elite, and I know this sounds a little bit populist, but I mean the people who I went to graduate school with, the people who I know who are in the United States government. I'm not talking about the elite over there. I'm very conscious of the fact that through strange accidents of life, I have myself ended up joining a kind of American elite. Uh, but the people who I know don't seem to believe in all that many things in a way that really does worry and concern me. But but I wonder whether there's an opportunity in the fact that there is actually an incohate liberal instinct that a lot of ordinary Americans have, who would not call themselves classical liberals, who would not be able to articulate the core tenets of liberalism, but who do share many of its uh, moral instincts and who activate it when they see blatant cases 
in which liberal precepts are violated. I think that's one of the reasons why public opinion moved to the left rather than to the right under Donald Trump's presidency. It's one of the reasons why Americans became more pro rather than anti-immigration over those uh, four terrible years because uh, they did not want to have any track with the cruelty of uh, the government and Trump's rhetoric. But I think it also makes me more optimistic about uh, the ability of liberals to push back uh, against some of the sort of rising liberalism on the left. So I guess my question is, what's the role for uh, you know, rousing articulations of liberalism? And I'm so wonderfully glad that we finally have one with, with your forthcoming book. And what's the role of uh, sort of a more popular and democratic uh, uh, defense of liberalism? Well, I think the two are actually linked to one another because I do think that you know, intellectuals actually do uh, establish, uh, you know, kind of the Overton window for acceptable, you know, rhetoric. And, and both on the left and the right, they've been pushing that window, you know, to, to greater and greater uh, extremes. And I do think that there can be some effort to, you know, close it again to, you know, exile certain views as really not being uh, acceptable in a, in a liberal society. Um, the other thing is that there are a lot of elite decisions that need to be taken. Like right now, I think, you know, the Democratic Party has really, in a sense, gone crazy. I mean, they're kind of imagining that this is 1932 and they've got this gigantic majority, supermajority in Congress. And the, you know, the real struggle is to pass this monumental, you know, uh, change in, in the, you know, the, the social protections of, of the United States. Uh, rather than being in this very precarious moment uh, where they stand a good chance of losing the elections in 2022 and more importantly in 2024, unless they kind of accept the reality that, you know, as you say, a lot of Americans uh, in the middle who are precisely the ones who are going to determine the outcome of those elections really do not you know, have any truck with, with the stuff that's coming out of the left wing of the Democratic Party. Uh, and so I think that, you know, in that respect, in terms of who the party, uh, you know, puts up uh, as, a, as a candidate, the way they speak about things. Uh, actually, Ross Douthat had a piece in the Times uh, uh, recently, you know, where he gave some examples of this. Uh, so it's not just uh, a question of, you know, not advocating defunding the police or something, but somebody's got to get up and say, you know, it's stupid to use the word Latinx referring to a Hispanic person because, A, first of all, Latinos and Latinas don't refer to themselves that way. I mean, it's a marker that you're a certain kind of progressive when you use that sort of language, but it's also a way of connecting with, I think, ordinary voters who will be the ones that will determine the next couple of elections, you know? Uh, and they're not demanding that we use uh, that kind of language. So I think that the, this inter-elite uh, discussion still does have a, you know, have an impact on, on uh, you know, how the rest of the country will react. I'm very glad that we mostly spoke about big and important philosophical topics. But as a final question, I, I do want to ask you where you think we're at uh, in the United States in terms of a threat to democracy from Donald Trump and Rotan populists more broadly. We're coming up to the first anniversary of the election in which uh, Joe Biden did, uh, once all the votes were in, you know, defeat Trump quite decisively. But at this point, uh, Biden is significantly underwater uh, in his approval ratings. Uh, in some polls, it seems as for Trump at this point might be a, a smidgen more popular than Joe Biden. It's very clear that Trump owns the Republican Party, but large parts of the Republican Party have not accepted the outcome of a 2020 election, um, or at least pretend to do so publicly, pretend that they don't believe it was uh, uh, accurate, and that they're passing quite concerning legislation at the state level that might allow them uh, not to certify uh, 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 the election in, in a proper way in 2024. So, you know, how worried are you about Republicans stealing the 2024 elections? How worried are you about Donald Trump or 
a Trumpist political candidate, winning fair and square. And, uh, you know, uh, just to ladle one more impossible question to something that I'm expecting a three minute answer on, um, you know, would American democracy be able to contain the damage the next time around, or would the damage end up being much worse than what we've experienced over the last four or so years? Well, I think right now we're in an extremely perilous condition in this country for exactly the reasons that you just articulated, that uh, uh, it's not just Donald Trump, but most of the Republican Party has been trying to change the institutional rules to guarantee that even if they lose the popular vote uh, in the coming elections, that they will still remain in, in uh, power. And I think that poses such a fundamental challenge to our institutions that that really ought to be the single focus of you know, everybody that cares about American democracy right now. And it trumps any other policy issue that uh, is currently on the table, which is why I find it a little bit upsetting that, you know, the Democrats can't just agree to get past the part of Biden's agenda that they can actually pass and then focus on reversing some of these state level laws that will ultimately, you know, award the, uh, uh, electoral count to whoever controls the state legislature. I think that's the single biggest uh, threat to American uh, democracy right now. Uh, whether that will actually work uh, is harder to say because, uh, well, first of all, I think it's very unlikely that Republicans will actually do better in the popular vote, either for president or collectively you know, for Congress, but they can certainly be in a position where they will get a minority of, of both votes and they'll still be in control of all three branches of, uh, of the elected government. Uh, and that's very dangerous because then people on the left are going to explode. And, and I do think that there's a real possibility for violence given how much you know, Americans love arming themselves. Uh, and whether American democracy survives that, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. I think that we really want to avoid putting ourselves in that position where we have to test those uh, institutions. Uh, but I do think it's going to be different from last November because I think that, you know, Trump and the Republicans have been also chewing over those lessons that they want to make sure that there's no Brad Raffensperger in power uh, the next time around that's going to actually throw not be willing to throw an election, you know, to, to them if, if it comes down to it. So yeah, we're, we're in a lot of, uh, uh, we're in a lot of trouble right now. Well, on that uh, cheerful note, uh, Frank Fukuyama, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thanks very much, Yasha. <laughs>